good to see you. It is a cloudy, rainy day here in Seattle. I got all my lights set up again, so I would actually be visible instead of being in the dark. It gets really dark here <laughs> when it rains. Uh, I have uh, my desk actually faces out on the windows onto the city of Seattle, which is nice. Um, but without the sunlight coming in, it's like I got my lights, my fancy circle light. Uh, it's good. Hope everyone's doing well. Hope you've had a good week. Um, I've been... <laughs> I've been busy playing a game called Team Fight Tactics. If you haven't heard of this, ooh, well, actually, so on the show a few times we've talked about auto chess, which is a Dota mod that a user created. Kind of took the a subsection of the streaming world by storm. Lots of people jumped in on it. Lots of streamers enjoyed uh, playing this game. And of course, all the developers from other companies took notice, and Riot, in particular, creators of League of Legends, are like, we're gonna make that. We can put that just in with our characters. And over the course of probably like six months or so, I mean, they might have been thinking about it even before that, but they got it going real fast. And it's playable now for free if you download the League of Legends client, and it is very fun and Kind of addictive so that's been basically my life for the last week or so is playing this game um so what's what's interesting about it is if you've ever played a, a moba dota or league of legends it's very real time it's very twitch you know you have to play, press all the buttons in a particular order you're on a team if you don't know the characters if you're not skillful it can be a very stressful experience but Auto chess or team fight tactics, as the League of Legends version is called, is stressful in a different way, but you're not actually. It's timed, it's real time, you have a timer counting down, but you're not timed for how quick you're moving your characters on the screen. It basically is a draft. So it's a timed draft. You're drafting the characters. If you get three of a kind, they merge into like a better version of that same character. Uh, and then you just keep doing that and you play with eight other people and there's player elimination so people fall out over time uh, but you're not on a team so to speak so you don't really have the potential for letting people down it's hard to explain exactly what's so compelling about it i think it's very strategic it's very strategic and very tactical i think even if you're more of a board game player than a digital game player it's something that could be of interest to you. And again, it is very addictive. <laughs> so if you tend to get to fall hard for games, then I'd be careful with it because I've been playing a lot of this game. And it's super fun. And I still want to try and create a board game version, which is why we had talked about auto chess in the past, because my merge game was kind of inspired by this, among other things. Um, so yeah, that's what I've been up to. Welcome, game biologist and Senior Bob, talking a lot, a little bit about what I've been up to. Um, yeah, I have, I've, as far as board game design goes, I have been working a little bit on the My Split the Loot game. I've talked about it a few times, haven't developed it a ton on stream, but this was the one, the constrained trading. You draw four cards, you have to pass two away to your neighbors. One has an activated effect and one goes into your stash. Playing around with a little bit of a deck tuning, not exactly deck building element because I took the, the draft card edition part out of it. Uh, the theme, split the loot, the theme was treasure, pirates, or dungeon type of thing. It wasn't really catching. So Phil and I had talked a little bit about, I could open the file, I'm just gonna hold up this piece of paper doing a Bowerbirds theme. Um, game biologist, I'm sure you know all about this, uh, but if, for other people who may not know what Bowerbirds are, they you've, you've probably seen pictures on the internet. They collect colorful items, they sort them by color, and they make this woven nest um, where they, they store all their things. And it's really cool, unique type of a, a bird. And they do this for to attract mates, I believe. Uh, so yeah, this is, get this up on camera, 
my totally redone game where I'm just like, I have a background of the leaves and you can see the different items the bowerbirds might collect, beetles, shells. Uh, they collect a lot of trash, um, little pieces of plastic or anything that's colorful that really attracts their eye. So I haven't had a chance to test it yet, but hopefully having more of a theme to the game. Cause the, what I liked about this mechanic is I haven't seen a lot of games doing this and it was very smooth and a good flow. It plays well at high player counts, but I'm still trying to find what's compelling about it. What really makes you want certain cards over other cards and feel bad about uh, having to trade away some of your cards. So the game, the core of the game loop is really making those tough decisions. This is a few things I've been doing and working on. Mm. Oh shoot, that reminds me. Uh, and then for next week, I'm actually traveling to upstate New York to see Phil's family. We're uh, doing kind of a wedding thing because we eloped and it was just the two of us and our families were a little bit sad about that. So we're going there and they're gonna wedding us, basically. They're like, we're gonna invite a bunch of family and hang out and you can eat bacon and French toast. Uh, so that part I'm excited about. It's, it's a little scary, a little nervous, but I think it's gonna be fun. I, we're traveling on Wednesday. I don't know if I'll be able to set up a stream, but I'll bring my stuff and try and get in like a little quick partial stream because I wanna keep up with the schedule. Senior Bob, awesome theme idea. I like quirky stuff like that. Yeah, I I actually looked it up because I wasn't sure. I'm like, certainly someone's done a Bowerbirds theme. I haven't seen anything. Not that there can't be more than one, but what I like about it too is like I've done a little bit of research and I like know a little bit about Bowerbirds, but the idea of birds just collecting colorful items even if you don't know what bower birds are, is kind of a known thing. So hopefully it's a theme that will resonate with some people. King Val just says, nest size versus nest shininess as competing strategies to attract a mate. Mm. Yeah, I like, well for this one, you would have the same number of cards. Um, I was playing, because for for the version I have, the other thing for it, for the mechanic, or for, for the scoring condition, was set collection. So it's just like, if you have the most pearls, you get a certain number of points. You're just sitting there counting up your points. And I've been thinking a lot lately about uh, scoring, end game, scoring conditions, how you keep the fun of the game flowing. You know, breaking, like we did this fun thing, and now we spread everything out and do the math. Um, I think it's a perfectly viable form of a game, but it's something that I would like to see if I can play around with a little bit. So actually setting up your bower with all your cards and potentially organizing them. So maybe there's a little mini puzzle there. It's like, oh, if I can have the most red things next to each other. So there's scoring. Oh, and then um, different birds, potential mates wanting different conditions. So maybe you have three scoring conditions that you're all kind of going for, and you can either go for the shared thing, or there can be other ways to score. Definitely a lot of stuff that I'm playing around with. Uh, oh yeah, finally, before we get right into today's brainstorming, I wanted to show off my Omni Gamer shirt. Uh, I'm actually gonna post the link for this in the chat. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, if you've been on Twitter, you might've seen it floating around, but my friend Dylan, who is a local designer whose game Mephisto came out recently, who's doing uh, graphic design for a lot of well-known tabletop companies and is all around an awesome person, has a t-shirt company now. It's called Tabletop. I'll post the link so you can see it. Uh, these shirts are awesome and our whole game group basically just bought a ton of them. Um, this is not a sponsored post. I, I wanted to make it completely separate. Say, you're my friend. I'm gonna pay you money to do your thing. I love your things. Uh, they have sweatshirts, t-shirts, different colors, all sorts of fun stuff there. Uh, he's just getting started, but already there's some really cool designs. And I think there's a lot of space for board game apparel, just like stuff. I think like, there's a lot of, you know, 
t-shirts for different fandoms, but I like the idea of playing around with apparel and I like wearing cool clothes and different t-shirts, different shapes, styles, um, instead of just like something specifically about like a product board game shirt, but this one is the Omni Gamer. It's got lots of stuff from all the different types of games that you might like. Um, so yeah, I'll post the link for that so you can check it out. And then we'll figure out our word for our brainstorm and we'll get started. Tabletop. Also, it's a really clever name. It's kind of punny. I like puns and stuff. Tabletop. I also just love more people being able to support themselves by making games and game adjacent stuff. So something that I'm very excited and passionate about. Okay. I got my pen. And what are we, what are we feeling today? Chat. I'm feeling, <laughs> I'm feeling like I want to be playing team fight tactics. Now I'm very excited to be here. I'm excited to work on a game, but I'm just like jonesing for this. Mm. I think <laughs> addiction might be uh, a little bit intense for a word to start with our brainstorm. Maybe something like compelling, like this concept of being compelled, feeling compelled to do something, feeling a strong desire to do something. Hmm. Like drink this delicious coffee I have over here. This is, this is, I know people complain a lot about Seattle being rainy, but it's just like, it's like those rainy days when you were growing up as a kid and you'd like curl up by the window with a book, maybe some hot cocoa, just feel really cozy, it just feels really nice and cozy today. So I'm really enjoying that cozy vibe. I'll put that off to the side here. Cozy question mark? Oh man, I don't know if we talked about this before. <laughs> Temptation fixated. Ooh, yes. All of those are perfect. <laughs> yeah, and I mentioned it before, I'll say it again. Part of why this is so inspiring for me is all those words that get jumbled up in my head. Um, like, what is that word I'm trying to think of? And y'all help a lot with that, which is great. Uh, I do. Yeah. I want to mention for, we have a lot of regulars here, but just in case this is your first time watching the stream, how this works is we start with our brainstorm. We're going to do a mind map here, starting with these words, throw out a lot of concepts that are related to them, go down some weird paths, and eventually settle on something that could potentially be turn into a board game. We'll talk about how we can mechanize that and sometimes usually what we've been doing then is getting to getting into Photoshop and starting to model out some of the pieces or cards that we might use for this concept. Uh, so it's idea to beginnings of a prototype. Uh, so it's a fun way to come up with some some new ideas. Definitely something I recommend if you're getting stuck on ideas, but it's also uh, useful to follow a thought process um, and how something comes from nothing. Like, I have no idea what we're going to make today and eventually evolves into something, which is a game of day. Intrigued. Compulsion. Com compulsion, yeah. I think, because I, I was thinking compunction. I'm like, compunction is not... The word that I'm thinking about. Compulsion. That's definitely, that's what I was going for. Compulsion. Uh, intrigued. I like the word intrigued. Because uh, intrigued means like extremely interested. Like I'm intrigued by you. Like interested. Not quite to an excessive, but almost excessive way but then if you look at the word intrigue it becomes more of like secrets spies uh unknown d 
de- like little known dealings, shadiness, plots. Which is one of the things I, I love about words, right? Just taking off, just changing the tense of it can make it be almost a completely different word. Keep it cozy. I don't think you can see the cozy, but it's down here in the corner. Cozy. <laughs> oh. Okay. I'm still interested in this compulsion thing, but talking about the spies and the secrets and the plots, I started reading the supplements for kids on bikes because I got a chance to talk with, I might have mentioned this before, but John Gilmore, who's one of the creators of Kids on Bikes, and Scott Gatta, who's Renegade Games, the publisher of the, the role-playing game. And so I got to read the quick start guide for that, and I started to read some of the ad- adventures and the it's supposed to be so it's kids on bikes the idea behind it is it's kind of like stranger things the role-playing game so it's very much we are kids we're not super powered heroes you know we're not fighters we're not going out on adventures we're just normal kid people uh and in the adventure book some of the stuff that happens you know there can be scary stuff there can be horror stuff there's aliens creatures danger for sure Uh, but one of the things um banana chan's story dads on mowers hers was in the this the supplemental adventures guide and there was a lot of different like spooky adventures you could have but one of her inspirations for this adventure was um Dream Daddy, I believe, and The Sims and things along that, that line. So I, I'll take creepiness. You know, I used to read scary stories, but this idea of the mystery being, you know, like we're finding the mayor of Coffee Town, who's this cat, right? So going on, it's a mystery, but like a cozy, a cozy rainy day mystery. Oh, and another thing that I was talking about recently was Encyclopedia Brown, if anyone remembers that. Encyclopedia Brown, kind of like Sherlock Holmes mysteries, but more puzzly. So if you read through it, you should be able to figure out the puzzle, but they weren't easy puzzles. I think with Sherlock Holmes, a lot of times they're more like stories. And you can't necessarily follow along and figure out the mystery. But with Encyclopedia Brown, it's a series of books with the, the mysteries in it that you would read through. And again, it was kids. So, you know, there's some crime and, like, a sense of adventure and danger, but it was never, like, dark or gritty. Uh, so that's not necessarily committed to that yet, but there's a lot of fun stuff. Fun ideas in there. <laughs> the fact that we're just doing thesaurus in the chat now makes me so happy. Mm. Enwrapped. Is enwrapped a word? Can you, you say that? Enwrapped. The enwrapped audience. Oh my gosh, I've never seen it used that way. I love that. Love learning new words. The enwrapped. I think. Because I feel like I would say the audience, the enraptured audience, or I would say the audience was enraptured, uh, more like a verb, uh, but enwrapped as the the adjective. I like that. Compelling enwrapped. <laughs> it's one of those words you look at that, and you're like, what is that weird combination of letters? Enthralled. Oh, that's such a good word, too. Temptation. Compelling. Enthralled. And I say, too, just the act of writing this stuff out, saying it, repeating it, looking at the definitions of things is a really cool, really fun way to get ideas flowing. Because sometimes just the way the word looks on the page, the organization of letters, 
other words that are tied to it, not by meaning, but by history, like enthralled. Oh, I remember when I learned this word in uh, freshman year of high school, it was one of our vocabulary words. And that makes you think of high school, right? So all these like weird connection webs in our brains can open up when we start thinking and talking about this. Oh, Game Ballers, you got to play Dadmon Mowers? Oh my gosh, that's so cool. I'm jealous, yeah. That, I, it's very, it's, it's interesting. Um, I'm interested to see, to hear more if you've done like a, a one shot of it or an ongoing campaign, but it looked very different from a lot of the RPGs that I've seen and played. So it seemed very fun, very exciting. Got the free version of that at Origins. Yeah, yeah, that's where I picked mine up. Charismatic. Senior Bob says, I've watched some role-playing vids of kids on bikes and I've gained a lot of respect for GMs. They do a lot of prep and have to think on their feet. Oh, totally agree. I I want to GM. I think I would be good at it because I used to tell my siblings knock off choose your own adventure stories in the car and I would just like, there's a giant mushroom and there's a door in it. Do you want to go in the door or do you want to walk down the path towards this swamp? They would like go into the door in the mushrooms like oh there's a family of rabbits in there sitting down to dinner and they look at you confused. Uh, I feel like I can do that improv spur of the moment stuff pretty well but for doing an actual role-playing game being the GM and being prepared uh, and the expectations the players would have is what scares me about it because for our Age of Worms campaign that we're doing. Uh, there's just stuff like with the known universe of Dungeons and Dragons. I think for an indie RPG, it's a little easier, especially one that's more real world based. You know, it's like you go into a supermarket in the 80s. Like we remember what a supermarket was like in the 80s, as opposed to, you know, this is what a behold, like you see a beholder and people are like, oh, I've got a sense of that. And as the GM, um, you just either have to have the stuff written down, but it helps if with the flow of the story, uh, to have all the directions, you know, all the things, all the set pieces and just balancing, uh, we're, we're getting into a role playing games here. So I might actually write some of this down. I might end up designing a role playing game. That would be cool. Uh, GMs experience versus a story like a, a role-playing game is a collaborative storytelling experience and there's big differences between a story and a game right there's sometimes the game aspects can interrupt the story aspects because you don't know the d definition of a game uh, at least how it's defined on ludology and other places is you don't know how a game is going to turn out you don't know what the outcome is going to be so if you're fighting a creature in dungeons and dragons or another role-playing game someone might die you know they might kill the creature really easily they might stick it to the wall with a web or something they might tie it down there's all sorts of unexpected things that could happen that could impact the evolution of the story so you can't prepare too much you can't get too committed to any one thing you have to be open and fast and loose to combine the the story and game aspects which is very fascinating and difficult and i think rpgs that i've played in the past when i've had not had a lot of fun with role-playing games it's when those things were it counter purposes when we got too wrapped up in the game aspect, for example, and totally lost the story. I would even say for something like World of Warcraft, I've been bouncing off of that a little more lately because like, I do like the characters there. I think there's very interesting stories. But there's just so much stuff now and the ways they've pushed the game uh, impinge a little bit on me and you see the same stories over and over because those are the kind of stories that you need to see it's like help my village all the people have been kidnapped and we need to go rescue them 
and then you do that, and there's more people, and then you collect some stuff, and then you you save them, and seeing the same thing over and over can take away from the excitement a little bit. He about says, come to Grand Con, and you can play with Banana Chan as well. She led a session I played at Breakout Con. Grand Con. I'll to, I don't know about that one. I'll have to check that out. I want to make... Uh, I have a partial list of cons, and I have the ones that I usually go to every year. The Paxes, uh, Origins, I'll probably go, be going back because I had a lot of fun there. Shucks, Gen Con, obviously, uh, and some other cons that I've kind of checked out and dabbled in, but I know there's a lot out there that I haven't got a chance to check out. Um, and I love seeing the different ones and how different people approach them. <laughs> Roll your enthralled die. Mm. <laughs> you are enthralled. <laughs> your die is enthralled. <laughs> okay, now I'm thinking more of a dice manipulation sort of a thing. <laughs> dice manipulation RPG? RPG question mark. Ooh, yeah. Speaking about dice, <laughs> another thing that I did yesterday was I played Vault of Dragons, which is a uh, Lords of Waterdeep themed game set in the Dungeons and Dragons universe. Uh, it was it was an experience. Uh, <laughs> I never want to say that a game is good or bad because often it might not just be a sort of game that I would enjoy but this one definitely made some choices that were questionable to me especially for uh, two things that really bug me in a game is it doesn't push towards conclusion so there's a lot of things in this game where you did an action and then you undid it. Like my special player power was uh, one of the actions you took was just putting followers onto the board. So you put followers on the board and they would have brawls with the other players and then go explore dungeons. My power was to take them off of the board and I got a treasure for that. And often like the treasures were very swingy. So for example, I could pay uh, two coins to put two fighters onto the board and that would take an action and then I could do another action to take them off of the board not in real time too so I couldn't do it as a response uh, I had to take a whole action to take them off the board and get a treasure and sometimes that treasure would just give me d4 uh, gold and d4 gold could be one gold so yeah, it could cost two actions to get negative one gold because it cost the two gold to put them on there. So there was a lot of undoing of the actions. And then when you fought, your characters came off the board. So getting the treasures kind of ramped you towards the end of the game, but it was hard to see your progression. Um, and then just knowing the choices that would lead you towards winning the game on any given turn. There's like, I have all this stuff to do, but if I put this here, you know, you might just fight me and I'll, I'll get that undone. So there's a lot of AP in trying to figure out how to get towards the end of the game. Um, anyways, how this comes back to dice manipulation and your die being enthralled is it's a dice game. So when you were going to combat, you would roll the dice, each character, uh, had a different dice. The rogues had a d4, um, fighters had a d10, wizards had a d12, and they had some stuff going along, which I thought that idea was really cool. Like with the kids on bikes, it's a very simplification of your traditional dice RPG mechanics, uh, tying it all back together. So kids on bikes, you have your six abilities, everyone has the same abilities, and what changes is which die. If you're better at it, you have a better die. So the thing you're best at, you have a d20, second best, d12, so on and so forth. So the thing you're worst at, you have a d4. Um, I think that's very evocative. Tying a dice to a character makes for some interesting choices. 
and now seeing role-playing games, potentially role-playing-esque board game, having your dice, like being able to manipulate them or having them manipulated by some outside force. I think there's a lot of cool ideas there. <laughs> dice manipulated by an outside force. <laughs> and you might say like, oh, well, like, uh, randomization, like gravity that usually affects the a dice being rolled. But I'm thinking something else, something a little more controlled and known. Dice manipulated by an outside force. I think there's some uh, some role playing games play around more with dice manipulation than others. Uh, not, not dice manipulation exactly, but I know for fate you can spend your fate tokens in certain situations to get additional dice. So potential for additional positives. Um, it's been a while since I've played, so I forget exactly how that works. But I think the randomness and role-playing games, it's, it's a blessing and a curse, right? Randomness in RPGs. So you need to have the randomness of the dice in there but you don't have to. If you don't have the randomness of the dice, it's more of a storytelling game, right? You don't have these absolute outside factors that will have those, oh shoot moments, right? Like big dramatic bursts of either a good thing happening, very exciting or a really bad thing happening. But that drama is what creates a lot of the tension in these games, but it can also create, if you're just using a flat, like a chance, you know, for, for rolling a d20, it can create, or if you're just like very good in a skill, it doesn't really matter if you, how you roll the dice, it can create some boringness as well. Or like it can create that drama, but it can also create a lot of frustration and it can sometimes prevent cool story moments you know it's like okay I'm going to depending on your, your DM or your GM as well if people are too beholden to the dice so you could say for example oh I'm going to jump off this ledge and grab the rope and I know it's a really tough check and I'm gonna have my sword in my other hand and like swing at the thing um, so that's a really cool story moment. And if you just fail your roll, you say like, you grab the rope and, or you fail to grab the rope and you just land on your face or something like that. Like you can, as a DM, you can play it off and make it more or less interesting. But, and then a lot of the times when you're just in basic combat, you're like, I'm going to swing my sword and... It's like, you miss because you don't beat their armor class. And if that happens over and over again, like the first, like the DM can make it interesting with like your sword, you know, glances off of their armor. But if you're stuck in that and like in a stalemate stitch situation, you can really grind things to a halt. And you don't know if that will happen or not because it's based, like you could have a combat that just goes on forever, right? If you're just rolling these dice and you just never no one ever takes damage you just sit there and just go on and on uh and there's ways to mitigate that but this is something that exists again it doesn't necessarily move to conclusion a combat can go on forever it doesn't necessarily move to conclusion and there's things you can do to judge that but just having to rely on pure randomness of the roles. Um, I'm interested thinking of different ways, either in a role-playing game or just a board game, 
things you can do to, to mitigate and keep things moving, right? Um, keep things going inevitably towards conclusion. <laughs> oh, Senior Bob, you're going to Grand Con too? Fun. Enthralled might be a spell in a D&D &D situation. All right. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, I love this uh, accumulating out of towners for conventions. Like you are the siren for Grand Con. Mm. Interesting mashups of more typical tabletop video game mechanics and more traditional RPG storytelling are Weave. Yes, Weave's a very cool system. Mm. For some reason, these links aren't hot linking. I wonder if that's something I have done. Fall of London, though. Fall in London. Cool. That is not one. Oh. <laughs> I put an extra bracket in there. Ooh, that is... Welcome, delicious friend. <laughs> that's kind of scary. I've not heard of that one, so... We'll definitely look more into that and check out what they're doing there. Weave uses tarot-ish cards to create story elements by scanning them into the game app and then rolling dice to resolve scenarios. Like, I like... Um, I've talked a little bit with the creators about that and some of the stuff that they're working on and the fact that you have your app. I think it's character creation. You can get started in 15 minutes. They really do some clever stuff with uh, getting around some of the sluggishness of traditional RPGs. Fallen London is a little grindy where you collect items to accomplish goals and get past barriers. Yeah, I could see that role playing. And again, it's just like, oh, it's fabulous and frustrating, right? Because you, as the DM or the GM, you're like, oh, they just need to get this. Like, we had a situation in our campaign recently where it's like, oh, they have to collect these things. I know where they are as the GM. They just have to go in all the rooms. They'll find the things. But then you put barriers in the way to make it interesting and exciting. But as the players, like, how do I know if you're putting a barrier there because I'm not supposed to go down there or you're putting a barrier there because you're trying to make it exciting for me, right? So one of the things we had to go underwater and there's this creature that was trying to kill us underwater. So like creepy. And as a person, as a player, not my character, probably my character too, but as a player, I'm like, freak, no, I'm not going in that cloudy water with the creature creepy murder skeleton mermaid like ew gross and no uh so that was i guess there, there, there's a good tension there but the thing we needed was down there and we didn't know you know we were kind of coming to an end we're like was there something that we missed and we had to swim through this water and there was a floating dead body there too so we actually had to go up it's like oh there's a floating dead body and you're like okay also gross and then we were going to leave, right? I think I said, like, oh, does they, do they have a pack or something? And DM's like, yeah, they have a pack. I'm like, okay. This striking that balance of, like, you know, the DM's just like, <laughs> are you sure you don't want to take this stuff with you? Because they just having this, like, the things that go on in players' minds are, like, you just have no idea. Things that seem so obvious to you can be not that obvious. Um, so going around collecting items, again, especially if you have a big city and you don't want to give them clues like, oh, it is hidden exactly in the tower, in the top room, under the bell, or whatever. Um, Dread does the Jenga tower, which adds an element of actual player skill. Yeah, I like that. Most fun I've had with dice rolling in RPGs has been when the game lets you work with other players to build bigger roles. Yeah. It gives you a sense of agency even though the dice are completely random. I totally agree with that. And that's another thing that Kids on Bikes does is lets you uh, spend... Uh, you get adversity tokens, I think, if you fail a roll, which I think is very clever, and you get to spend those, uh, I think, to help your rolls or to help other people with a skill. So you can add your dice, 
And I think there's a lot of great space for story and flavor in there. So say uh, charm is one of the things, right? You have your most charming party member who's going up to someone at a party and trying to get some information. So it's like, oh, I haven't, are you new to town? Or like, I guess it's a small town, so you would know. It's like, oh, you're new to town. Maybe you need someone to show you around. You just roll really par poorly on your charm. And then someone else who's got like low charm or whatever just gets in there and says, like tries to wingman it and like maybe does, does a good job and that's exciting. Or maybe just makes it even worse. And anything you can do to have more collaborative storytelling, I think is really cool. He about it says, I've been reading some interesting conversations on Twitter about what the role of the DM is and how the easy temptation is to think the DM is the opponent of the players uh, versus seeing the DM as being on the same side as the players. Oh yeah. I mean, this is, this is really the crux of it with role-playing games because it's easy to see the, the opponent. They're, they're trying to wreck you. Like we had a combat uh, we went down into a dungeon, I guess. We were trying to rescue this person, and we're like, we got to the door, and we'd only seen a few people go in there, so it's like, okay, it might be tough, but we went in there and opened another door, and there was like 30 people in there, right, who were charging at us, and we're, our party's four. <laughs> so the DM, like, set it up, so it was 30 people in one room, two, like, unkillable skeleton golems in another room coming at us and a giant house-sized boar creature charging at us we escaped <laughs> without anyone dying amazingly but it's hard to go into that and be like wow we were supposed to fail there and that can feel really bad like oh, why why did they set up a situation where we would fail you know we don't want to fail no one wants to fail it doesn't feel good uh so it can be hard not to see the dm as the enemy i think i'm interested in uh more collaborative systems and games where again kids with bikes is or kids on bikes is like this where the DM or the GM and the players are creating the world collaboratively. So, shoot, what was the one? Uh, okay, yeah, so I read the Apocalypse World System book, and that was, I haven't gotten a chance to play in a Powered by the Apocalypse game yet, but I'd really like to, because I like what they do. Every part of the book calls out how the players work with the GM to create the world. So if, if your character would know this, it's like you have a little, like, it's post-apocalyptic, obviously. So you have a little tower shack made of corrugated metal where you like to hide out and you've got this little space. So you, like, climb up in there and the DM's like, okay, what's in there, right? <laughs> so you're not relying on the GM to create everything in the world. It's like, you would know that, right? This is the place you go all the time. It's like, oh, yeah, I've got, like, um like a TV frame with the glass taken out and I have some succulent plants in there that I'm trying to keep alive because there's not a lot of plants around uh, and maybe I have some shiny CDs right that I've made uh, mobiles out of and they reflect the light so encouraging that and in any role-playing game even in uh, our game of Dungeons and Dragons we, our, our DM will say like, oh, what does your spell look like? What, what relationship does your character have with this person? Uh, so I think GMs can either encourage or discourage that. And I think when they do encourage it, it makes it better for everyone. DM, a mysterious speck of light hovers above the water as if beckoning you. I think a non-combat RPG would appeal to me more. Doesn't mean you can't set traps and distractions. I very much, <laughs> I very much agree with you, Senior Bob. And that's why I would like to play something like Dads on Mowers because, or like the kids on bike stuff, combat is very dangerous. You, anytime you fight, someone could die. So you're really not meant to fight because you're kids, right? You're kids and teenagers. You're not meant to be shooting arrows or spells or hitting things with swords, right? For the most part. Um, and I think, like, I've had fun with Dungeons and Dragons combat, but it can also just get very mechanical. And again, 
because it doesn't necessarily push to conclusion, you can have very dramatic fights and then you can have boring fights and you can have fights that are over too quickly, fights that go on too long. There's just not a lot of control for making it a good experience. More control for making a good shared experience. And I think it can still be mechanical. Like I've made a story game and then we died is a storytelling game. It's good, it's very fun, very lightly mechanical. Uh, and I like playing storytelling games. I've had a lot of fun doing it, but I can see what interests people in having it be strategic and mechanical. So thinking about ideas, strategizing non-combat, you know, for making it very strategic for you to more of an intrigue game, very political, right? Like I have to talk, like who in town do we have to talk to, to get someone to unlock this door. D&D &D does have a little bit of that and depending on your group it can have more of that but you also just always have the option well it's like oh we can't get through this door i'm gonna pick the lock or i'm going to stab people until someone drops a key right i think just having a game where that's really discouraged or where you even can't fight i don't know it's interesting interesting thoughts to think about Game Battle says, seems like GM-less games, quiet year dialect fiasco would make it easier to lean into the yes and style of improv storytelling since you're not undermining a DM's well-laid storyline plans. So it might not feel as much like you're being set up to fail in challenges. Yeah, I, and again, I think, I, I really think the ideal GM scenario is like I, I think yes and improv should be in every role playing game. Any like anyone comes up with a cool thing, it not that you have to do. It's like oh I want to spend a week digging holes into the side of this mountain and climbing up this mountain or whatever it is you know. Not that you should always be allowed to do that, or not that you shouldn't have to roll dice for that or that you should force the hand. Um, but I think you can come up with fun, cool stuff through collective brains. That's why we're playing together, right? I think a GM shouldn't be too beholden. Like if you have this amazing story where it's like, oh, they're gonna do this, they're gonna meet this person, they're going to go and fight a dragon, and instead they buy a bakery. <laughs> I don't know. Or they like win a bakery in a bet and now they're like have this bakery and they're just like selling bread all of a sudden. I don't know. It could be for a fun, interesting story. Like that anime I haven't had a chance to watch yet. It's all about a bakery. I think that sounds very fun. Uh, you win a bakery. I don't know where this is going. I'll write it down. In a bet. And now you're just selling bread bread and pastries and this is your life now uh, but I think part of an important part of yes and yes and doesn't mean oh every time someone says something we're going to accept that and now this is in the world and I can say anything and without consequence like that's not what yes and means having a yes and mentality means that you care about the players, you care about the magic circle, you have a shared expectation of what the experience is gonna be like. Uh, and you're putting things out there that will add towards this. So for a D&D game, you know, this is, like, I would like to have a bakery. I, sure, I would love to role play. It's like, and then I go to the market and buy some flour. I think that would be fun. But that's not the world or the story that we've all bought into collectively. And 
And that's also really important with uh, consent, right? And for any sort of shared experience, the expectations, meeting people's expectations while like having a balance of meeting the expectations and then having the pushback, like the scenario, our DM set up where we did fail. I, it hurt, like it felt bad. But good, too, because it's like, we could fail in this world. Like, we're not going to succeed at everything. Like, we're going to have bad screw-ups. And making that a possibility in this world really changed my perspective about what we are doing and what we are playing. And raised the stakes, too, right? Like, there's consequences for our actions, which is really cool and doesn't happen all the time in role-playing games. There are consequences for actions. Game Biology says, I got sucked into a combat-ish RPG playtest at Gen Con last year, and I was too tired to deal with combat, <laughs> right? I know, it's hard. So I strongly embraced, uh, embraced, embraced clueless empathy as my weapon of choice. Our party prevailed using teamwork and the admonition of what would your mother think with the baddies? Oh my gosh, I love that. <laughs> and this, oh man. And again, I like d and I've had a lot of fun playing, but this is my other thing about this and about people who play Dungeons and Dragons a lot is um, like they go up and anything you can fight, right? You can get into a fight with anything, you can kill anything. You walk into a room and there's like a water elemental and experienced players be like, oh, we got to kill the water elemental. But for me, I'm like, do we? How do we know if we have to? Do we try talking to it? And I, I don't necessarily want to be that person who tries talking to everything, but I feel like there's a lot of situations where, I don't know, you have a conversation with someone. Um, yeah, one of the baddies in our campaign, I, shoot, what did, what was the thing? So we're trying to get some information out of this person and they they ran like this like really seedy bar where people got murdered and stuff so they're like oh I'm, have, come down to the basement with me and we'll talk and i went by myself into the basement with this huge albino uh orc creature and they started saying what he was gonna do to me to my character uh, and he, he, oh, he, he like called my bluff basically. He's like kind of starting, it was getting dire. Anyways, I changed my tact and I was like, look, you're right. It's like we haven't been completely honest. We're just, um, shoot, what was the scenario? It's just really important to us that we like find this person. I just bared my soul and I was completely honest about our the thing that we were trying to be sneaky about and I rolled really well and so he took pity he's like you know I, I used to be like you so I like to see more of that in role playing games <laughs> why do they have to always kill the dragons right why why poor dragons what have they ever done why are they bad why can't we be friends why can't they just go out doing competitive dragon watching to try and get the biggest life list it gives a whole different meaning to a big year. Oh, this, okay. Kind of pivot, but you, game biologist, mentioning that, um, like bird watching, but with dragons. So I've never done bird watching before, but I've read enough articles and stories about people doing it. It's like you have your book, you have your identification guide, you have your binoculars. Um, maybe take a picture or maybe not, you just mark down that you have seen this bird and kind of corroborate which bird it is. So that could be really cool, but with dragons. Uh, and mythological creatures, maybe.
I could see it being a, a board game or maybe even just a really relaxing um, slow time video game. Something like Neko Atsumi, if you've checked that out, you just go there and cats show up or not at your house. But maybe you can kind of be walking around uh, Neko Atsumi, walking around to different locations, traveling, different regions, have different dragons, might be difficult to identify, you get better at it over time. Phil and I have been talking about uh, walking games or slow time strategy games potentially tied into the steps tracker from your phone. So you walk around and you actually get to travel. There are games like this, but again, they're combat, right? You go, you earn up the points and then you fight stuff. It's like, why does that be fighting stuff? What if you just traveled around and you would turn up in different locations and then be able to go in there uh, and like just check in time to time and see if there was a dragon in there. Bakery sounds like one of those dating <laughs> games. Uh, bakery date, yeah. Bakery dating sim board game. Sure. <laughs> yeah, you're baking the bread, and then someone comes in there, and you have to woo them with your pastries. Oh no, my key came out. Pressed. Pressed too good. Uh, woo them with your delicious pastries. Uh, you have to roll the dice for how tasty your baked goods will be. Uh, <laughs> and then you get a reaction. Maybe you have to give the right uh, goods to the right people, like in Stardew Valley. So if you play at Stardew Valley, each person has very unique tastes. Some people like sushi, some people hate sushi, some people like chocolate cake. Some people hate chocolate cake. Actually, this is a real thing. I mean, some people just don't like chocolate and that's fair. Still, it's fair, it's fair. Uh, but yeah, for this one, specific specifically having baked goods and having to give the things to different people be like uh, cheese danish. Like here's a cheese danish and you roll for it, but you don't necessarily know how well you've done. Like, it looks a little burnt. <laughs> You're like, maybe it's still okay. And they eat it and like, maybe they like things that are burnt. Uh, maybe they don't like that type of pastry or maybe you just, didn't do good enough. Ooh, or like the diner, was it Diner Dash? Like the food serving games? Like that's more of a real time thing, but you have to make the food um, and then serve it to all the customers. But maybe it's more, instead of being real time, you're trying to get the right food to the right people. If we are talking tabletop, you could have like your, your people in the, I don't know why they're in windows. This is just how I picture them. Uh, and these are like curved cards too. I don't know why I'm picturing a deck of cards. It's kind of like the shape of a CND. But you have characters who come into the windows and you have to serve them. Ooh, you could have like really cool Meeples. Uh, this is probably too far down. Serve the customers. So unique card shape. And then on the window tray, you'd have like a bread shaped meeple. Do I have my food meeples here? Mm, I have like the bow tie pasta one. I don't actually know what that is. <laughs> Unique meeples! 
bread meeples and like a cake meeple. I don't know what that would look like. Maybe we use our Google foo for it. No way this is going to come up. Oh, what is this? Oh, it's a cake. <gasps> meeple cake. Oh, is this, um... Oh, interesting. I was going to say Sugar High Score is the one who often does this, but... Oh, that looks so cool. Okay. Get distracted. Like a cake meeple, like a carrot meeple. I've seen those before. <laughs> Senior Bob says... If I wanted to derail an RPG session, I would try to order pizza or something in the game universe. Yeah, right, because sometimes you have an open session where you can go around and be like, I want to look for, like, a coffee shop. Like, is there coffee in this universe? I just want to get, like, a really nice cappuccino. I want to talk to all of the characters. <laughs> We're going all over the place here, but that's cool. We'll run with it. <laughs> Ordering coffee or the equivalent in D&D. &D. Talk to all the NPCs to find the best coffee or whatever. Then going and tasting it and talking about it with other characters. <laughs> Could this be a role-playing game? Is this a role-playing game? It's all about, oh my gosh. Epiphany. <laughs> Is there a role-playing game that's just all about eating delicious food and drinking delicious beverages? Oh my gosh, this is like a uh, role-play- uh, RPG meets not Iron Chef um, or, like, Great British Bake Off. So not, one, not like, a reality show where some is good or bad, but something where it's just, like, all the food is amazing. So today's session, we go to the sushi restaurant <laughs> and just talk about all the food we're ordering and eating yeah that's the that's the that's the game that's it we just eat delicious food and talk about it and then we go out for coffee and dessert and talk about the ice cream and all the ice cream flavors oh my gosh that actually <laughs> that reminds me of this game my siblings and i used to play because we used to travel we we're in the hotel again sometimes it would be role playing or not role playing it'd be like choose your own adventure stories and sometimes it would be, we just talk about food and like fake food and like, oh, I'm making this tasty strawberry cake. Who wants to eat the strawberry cake? And we like fight over the fake pretend imaginary cake and candy. Um, eat imaginary cake. Sure. <laughs> Birding culture is a lot like gamer culture in a lot of ways. Back to the bird watching stra uh, slash dragon watching. There are gatekeepers, there are casual folks, there is scorekeeping, there are con like events, there are tournaments. Oh my gosh. There's tournaments for bird watching? That's so cool. I didn't realize that. That's super fun. Have you ever geocached? It's got race elements and exploration elements, but the goal is just to leave a note and trade a trinket. The score has less emotional value than the journey to get there. I was looking at geocaching for a while. I forget, I might have done a cache, or I might have just found a cache accidentally and then read into it. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of cool, interesting stuff there. Senior Bob, idea for an RPG universe. You are a hitchhiker and get picked by strange people. I like that too. I like that. It's like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, how do you spell Hitchhiker's? Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Is this a thing? This should be a thing. If this isn't a thing, I want to make it a thing. 
Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy RPG. The 30th anniversary edition of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy game. Has this been an RPG for like... Uh, for like 30 years? So RPGs can be different things. Like a role-playing game or like a digital role-playing game. Hmm. So there is a video game. <laughs> There is, oh yeah, there's definitely a video game. Cool. Ooh. Ooh, I might have to talk to some people. It's like, how do we get the IP rights? I want to make RPGs. I want to write RPGs. Hitchhiker's Guide is definitely a cool one. Mm. Or could be an adventure in another system. It's Yelp the RPG. Find the tastiest comestibles in town. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the whole thing. And then you go there. Oh, and again, it's uh, yes and cooperatives. And some, or maybe based on, based on the dice rolls. So it's not you're making tasty food, but you're eating the food and it may or may not be tasty based on the dice rolls. Food may be delicious, delicious, mediocre, or terrible. So I was like, oh, I went to the sushi restaurant, it's a very popular one, and you roll the dice to see how delicious it is. Uh, and maybe you have thresholds as a character. This is where the role playing element could come in. You have thresholds for how picky you are, how much of a foodie, I think is a better way to put that, how much of a foodie you are. So you roll, like if your character just is like very, very foodie when it comes to sushi, you're examining the cut of the fish and you're like, oh wow, this is really impressive. Like if you crit with the rolls, like, oh, this is the most amazing sushi. They've cut it with the grain of the fish you can see right here. And the rest of it is just being like, I don't know, it tastes good. It tastes it tastes fine to me. Or or you roll the dice really badly, like, oh it's the fish is not entirely fresh. I mean it's not bad, it's not inedible, but it just tastes like it's not the best that I've ever eaten. Or it's just like a little the temperature, the rice is not soft enough. Just describe describe your eating experience it's like oh and i put the sushi in my mouth and the the soy sauce and wasabi are just the right amount of pungent for the perfectly crisp um And I know, I know that the soy sauce wasabi is like an American thing. It's not the real way to eat sushi, but I like that. So I'm just going to write that. And wasabi give the perfect amount of pungence to the, um, to the fried, ebby is shrimp, right? Fried shrimp, just the right amount of crisp and crunch, and then there's some, I don't know, avocado in there that is also very tasty. <laughs> you could probably play this for like half an hour before it just completely went off the rails, but it's just a fun thing to think about. It's also very tasty. <laughs> Food eating as a mechanic reminds me of Takaido. Oh my gosh, right? You look at the picture. The game makes me so hungry. And like, I want to go to Japan. Because everything here, like, the stuff on a stick. Like, I, I looked that up of the um, uh, pastry balls on a stick. Uh, oh, dango. Oh my god. Oh. Okay, I'm hungry again. <laughs> This, oh my gosh. Oh, it's mochi. Oh, it's mochi too. Oh my gosh, yeah. 
Oh, just looking at this, the pictures of this stuff. I'm like, I have never wanted to eat something. I like food. I don't know if I've talked about that before. <laughs> Maybe mentioned it once or twice. I've never wanted to eat something more in my life. I ate lunch, too. I don't know. I guess it's getting closest to dinner, but this is just making me hungry now. Hitchhiking during the apocalypse. Ooh, I like that. I like that matchup. Oh, I mean, it's like Mad Max meets Hitchhiker's Guide. Ooh, is this something? Ooh, all of this or eating, role-playing. This is something I could tie back into what to eat after the apocalypse, right? To eat after the apocalypse, maybe it comes a role-playing game. Um, <laughs> going on a journey, eating food, getting radioactive. Uh, or just, I like the, because I want to explore post-apocalyptic worlds, but again, without the fighting, without combat, or at least without focus on that. So something like Mad Max, you know, with the cars, but instead of like chasing and trying to kill each other, you're just like hanging out, going around, checking stuff out, trying to survive, just the the mundane experience of surviving after the <laughs> and that's what I like I think that's what I like about Waterworld obviously they have fighting and combat and the explosions galore but there's also just you know he's got the plant and there's this whole thing about him finding the plant and purchasing the plant and taking care of the plant uh, and I think that's a very poignant thing. It's something very evocative that's really stuck with me. The higher the Yelp rating of the place you're eating at, the more dice you can roll. And sometimes you get food poisoning in a four-star place. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, it's four star. It's like a four-star. It's got their Michelin star. You know, everyone's talked... Cause I've had the, we've had that experience, you know, everyone's had that experience. You go to the restaurant that all your friends talk about so highly and you go on like a really busy day or it's like the day after Valentine's day, everyone's, the restaurant just got, um, got their food quality. They, they had the, an inspector come and they found something, they were doing some weird stuff. You know, you never know. All these things can feed into the food experience, even a place that has a great menu, has a great chef. There's a lot of stuff behind the scenes. That can happen even if they have um, a great chef and a great menu. Off day for the staff, someone quits. Surprise, inspection, find something, uh, shipment, got delayed or canceled. Tension on the staff, there's a lot of stuff that can happen. Dice rolling for food quality taste experience is a cool idea, cool. Mad Max with food trucks? That's really good. I like that. Mad Max with food trucks. Uh, the food trucks are all stuff like um, skewered mole rat and unidentified can. <laughs> here dice rolling for food quality taste yeah 
Get my unicorn water here. Hmm. Well, as usual, we're coming up with all sorts of fun and crazy and wacky ideas. Hmm. I don't even know what I want to focus on. There's, we've gone pretty wide here. What did we even start from? We were talking about things being compelling, talked about Encyclopedia Brown, moved into just role playing games, not even from our brainstorm, like we just got there. And now we're role playing food eating. Hitchhiking after the apocalypse and bird watching slash geocaching, but with dragons. <laughs> and I have this picture here of this board game. Now we're serving customers. Oh, and that's the other one, the dating sim, right? The bakery role playing game dating sim. <laughs> New just says, it feels like it's time to pull compulsion back into this. They're very aggressive food truck operators after the apocalypse. Mm, mm, good call, good call. Yeah, I like that. Hmm. Um, interesting. What was the food truck game that I had played? Mm, I don't think it was Food Truck Champion. I think there's a few. Truck off. I think it was truck off. If I see the images of it, because uh, you have the tokens of the different places. Yeah, it was definitely truck off. So in truck off, uh, the food trucks are kind of competing feed people. So it could be a similar thing, but post-apocalyptic. <laughs> Make this, but post-apocalyptic, your survival. I can't spell. <laughs> Survival literally depends on you feeding people. So you do anything to get people to your truck. Uh, <laughs> Spiking the competitors, competitors with radioactive. Uh, wolf meat. <laughs> uh, I say that um, cans with botulism. Uh, maybe there's a collection phase for the truck operators. So this could tie back into what to eat after the apocalypse. Collection phase for the truck operators where they go out and gather the food, they check it for poison or radiation, maybe? Then trade away or trade away the bad stuff, steal the good stuff, or just don't really care. <laughs> what their customers eat. Customers eat uh, compulsion. So you can, they're very pushy. Pushy, use sales techniques. Oh my God, this is tying back into food chain magnet as it does. Food chain magnet where you uh, put that billboard uh, 
right in front of people or maybe literally lasso them. I don't know how you spell lasso. 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 Lasso? Lasso. That looks weird. I think that's, I think that's what that is. <laughs> Fight Thunderdome style to get to a food truck or time truck. Gosh, this I love it, and it's bizarre and silly, and this is fun. Society has rebuilt around food truck clans. Oh my gosh, food truck clans. Ooh, this this is a great matchup. I love where this is going. Customers pay in scrap metal. Nice. You want to enter and get protection of the fish taco clan. Got to fight your way past others for the few chances to join. <laughs> fight to the death to be part of the food. <laughs> be part of the shawarma. Let me get to see. Shawarma. Plan. Uh, join the best truck. Or die. Let me say that. Join the best truck. <laughs> With the food least likely to kill you or people. Hmm. What does this look like? What is our silly food truck? Uh, food... What are we calling this? Food truck dome. Um. Rise of the food truck clans. Eat or die trying. Or battle. Battle of the food truck clans. Battle of the food truck clans. The names for these things are really... <laughs> Oh, I'm thinking like maybe there could be like a battle element or a cook-off element or the trucks are fighting each other. Battle element. So maybe you're trying to get into the food truck clans or maybe you're playing as the food truck clans trying to attract other people. The trucks are in the <laughs> The trucks are in the Thunderdome battling but not combat non combat battles. Uh, <laughs> so we got our cage match here, right? And all our spectators watching the battle. They get out and they're very like anime dramatic about it and they're like, welcome to the Thunderdome. And then they just get out and cook at like a barbecue. Here's the smoke coming out of it. <laughs> Thunderdome cook off. <laughs> That's pretty good. Thunderdome cook off is another good name.
Dead or alive, you become part of the clan. Oh, are we, are we back to cannibalism now? Why does it always come back? Why is it always cannibalism? <laughs> Why? It's always cannibalism. Yeah, if you're dead, you become the food. If you lose... The cook-off Thunderdome battle, you become the food. Flick them up with players trying to take out other racers and the food trucks trying to take out inferior racers so they only get the best. <laughs> Fighting for the best. Post-apocalyptic chefs. Can you work wonders with roadkill? How are you at making unidentified meat products not taste bad? What wonders will you envision with mystery cans that are a hundred years old. Does canned food really go bad? I mean, I know it does. So it's interesting to think, you know, what food, what lasts? Like, they've dug up those, the sarcophagi with the honey or whatever, right? That's still edible. I don't know how they find that out if someone's really eating. The, the honey or the things that have been in the jars for 4,000 years. But that's a thing that people have done. Dia, the food trucks pull up alongside other vehicles, chasing, fighting, and try to sell food to the combatants. <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, it just gets better and better. I took roadkill stew to work a few times a while back. It was super yummy. Fresh meat is the secret. Mm -hmm. I guess so. I just know, uh, yeah, well, getting it fresh is important. Like, how do you know how fresh it is? And then also, um, the, the preparation of the meat, because I know with the, the blunt force trauma can do weird things to the meat. Not that I've tried preparing it myself, but there's considerations. Roadkill stew. <laughs> it's another good name for the game. Mm. It's another direction too, right? Like, who can make the... Hmm. Who can make the best food with found or foraged ingredients? or foraged ingredients. Uh, I know locavore, uh, urban foraging? I feel like there's a word for that. Falling, uh, local, uh, shoot. Maybe it's just called urban foraging. I thought there was another term for it. <laughs> Finding foods. Old canned food allegedly killed HP Lovecraft? I did not know that. He ate expired canned food and wrote to a friend, I was never closer to death. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know how fresh it is while your car is sitting there disabled while you wait for the tow truck. <laughs> oh no, game biologist. Oh, I know that feel. The uh, Especially if it's a deer or something. Having lived in Maine, like, that's... Pretty much everyone has that experience, right, of, of hitting the deer, and, uh, I mean, it, it sucks for the deer, obviously, it's very sad, uh, but also, 
sucks to be on the receiving end of that. <laughs> it's like, how fresh, fresh meat. Oh, wow. Food truck, Thunderdome. So it's a racing game. Still looking at this, playing around with this. Uh, you have your your tracks, and you have your trucks, tracks and trucks. This is a top down view. And you're trying to maybe you have a fleet of trucks or a few trucks. You're trying to pull up alongside them. Or if you're like one, like half a space ahead of them or something, you have priority. Um, yeah. It's a racing game. Where you're trying to position your trucks just right. Uh, if you have priority, you get to serve the other trucks, and then you get points for that. Maybe one side of the truck has a receiving window, and one has an operating window. This reminds me of a game that Phil and I worked for a game jam, worked on for a game jam where you had your cards uh, and each card, what does a truck look like from the top? Uh, each card was a truck and they would be or like um, this game, it was called Truck Tango, it was about cars moving around a freeway like in a heist situation. So they would be next to each other uh, and you'd be jumping back and forth between the different trucks trying to fight fight each other off but they're all right next to each other so you can kind of hop between them and there's a programmatic movement um, in which each truck each round i think there might have been a randomized element but the trucks were constantly it's like you roll a dice okay number four truck moves right. So you got like a little bit of AI there to determine where the trucks go. Uh, so we could bring back that idea, but with the, the feeding. So instead of fighting on these trucks and trying to beat each other up, you could be feeding. Feed, don't fight, feed. Came by and just says, my folks bounced two deer at once and called me to come pick them up. I got there just after the state trooper. My first question was, can they keep the meat? Turns out that was the first question my dad had asked as well. <laughs> They'd earned that venison. Yeah, I mean, I have friends in Maine who... Oh, yeah, actually, that's a good question. <laughs> Come up with all sorts of good questions on the stream. What are the rules for keeping venison you hit with your car? I have friends in Maine who go hunting and that's like a big part of their food. You know, some people will buy like a cow share and get a lot of meat from that, but I have friends who literally like live off of the deer meat that they get during the hunting season and you know you don't always find a deer so it can be a good way to get meat and obviously there's the hunting season times when you're supposed to hunt deer not hunt them but if you hit the deer with your car you know obviously it's, presumably it's not intentional Yeah, it's like, yeah, you're gonna let this good meat go to waste. I think I think the only deer meat I've had before is deer chili. Uh, I seem to remember that it was pretty good. If Maine is like New Hampshire, the locals 
descend on a roadkill moose as soon as it happens, trying to claim the meat. <laughs> the driver usually isn't in any condition to claim it. Oh, jeez. Yeah. I mean, deer is bad enough, but a moose. Like, if a deer gets in a fight with your car, you know, your car may or may not be okay. If your car gets in a fight with a moose, the car is not probably coming back from that. Ugh, it's scary to think about. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of meat. A lot of good meat on a moose. I had moose uh, sausage, like dried smoked sausage. I think it was moose and blueberry in Maine. Uh, not in Maine, in Norway. They, they have that. Uh, it was very tasty. So Rob says, I've only hit one deer. I thought it was rude of it to run off after denting my hood. So you can get the meat from it. Roadkill permits are typically a free permit, though some states put conditions on who, how to claim it. Hmm. That is interesting. And also, like, when or how do you get that? Do you just have one in case you come across the roadkill? Or do you have to apply, apply for it, like, after you hit a deer? Or someone hits a deer, it's like, oh, quick, I can get the permit real quick so we can, uh, to make, make this all above board and legal to claim this roadkill meat. Whew. Wow, so lots of good stuff today. Lots of weird, bizarre, interesting stuff, which is definitely where I like to go with the stream. I don't... Man, I'm still... My, my mind is buzzing with these ideas. I don't really have anything firm enough to go to prototyping. I don't think I'm going to go try and prototype any of this just yet. Because I have a lot of ideas, but I'm not sure exactly which one of them I want to move forward. It's okay. Today's going to be more of a ideation brainstorming day, which is totally cool and is the main purpose of this stream. I've been going for... When did we start this? Must have been... Was it January or February? March? Must have been three or four months that we've doing been doing this, so... I've been having a lot of fun. I think it's very useful. I think just being able to have a, a weekly time where nothing is verboten, ideas will flow free like wine, and come up with all sorts of cool stuff here. And I, I do have a lot of games, game ideas that I would like to move forward with or work on. Like last week with the red light, green light game, I think that one came out pretty close to being formed and probably wouldn't take too much work, to, at least to get to the table for a prototype. That's another thing I've been thinking about game design as well, is just getting more prototypes to the table with less, uh, less attachment to them. Because I think you never know before you play a game, even if you're self-testing a game, you never know before you get in front of people if there's really a spark there. And I think instead of getting too attached to a particular game and trying to push it, and like with What to Eat After the Apocalypse, I love the idea, I love the theme. I've tried a couple of different things, but I'm not sure now where I'm gonna go with it. And it could be a better use of time to back burner for now and just get like the red light green light get some more stuff onto the table uh and play around because you never know you might just have something that comes out fully formed and works really well and see that from testing as opposed to you know, there's infinite ideas right with all the stuff we, we come up with three or more ideas for a game every single week that's only doing this once a week, right? So my list of things I could be working on is very long now. So it's it's good to have those ideas flowing and not get too wrapped up in one, any one idea being the magical idea. Because uh, you never know until you get out there what's really, what's gonna resonate with players and what's gonna resonate with you, right? What you wanna move forward and dedicate your time to. Any of these things that we came up with sound really cool uh yeah yeah philosophical philosophical ramblings on game design daily game design live game design stream <laughs> one nice thing about working at new hampshire fishing game is that potlucks often had moose dishes nice 
Permits are generally issued by officers, so when you call to report your accident for insurance purposes, they can walk you through the process. Oh, okay. See, we're learning a lot about roadkill permits today. I love learning stuff. New weird facts. That's, that's what this show is now. It's live game design stream and learn cool new facts from cool smart people who talk about fun stuff. <laughs> this stream is a great creative space. Thank you, Senior Bob. It's definitely what I hope to create here is I hope I come up with new ideas. I hope it makes you all think about stuff, either stuff to help you with games you're already working on or perhaps inspire you to work on new games. Between conversations here and on Twitter, I'm creeping toward having a concrete idea of how to build a Have You Had Enough Potato Chips prototype. Yes. <laughs> I am full of random and mostly use useless. Okay. There's going to be a whole wave of games that's like the dragon watching game, the roadkill game, Thunderdome truck champion game. And people are going to look at this and be like, what, where do these even come from? It's like this font font of creativity and inspiration and there's going to be a line of have you had enough x x game so have you enough ch potato chips have you had enough cheese have you had enough mochi like there's just so many foods that you can never have enough of and we can make games about all of them well i think that's about it for me for today some freeform creativity flowing today. I want to sit down and prototype some, some of those games we've been talking about because I think there's a lot of cool stuff and I'd like to get some of that to the table. Uh, as I mentioned, I will be traveling, so I'm not sure when exactly that will happen. We'll be traveling to upstate New York and then at the end of this month traveling to Gen Con. Lots of fun stuff. It's going to be a few Busy few weeks, that's for sure. A busy month <laughs> uh, in game design space. Uh, if you are enjoying the show, this is my weekly board game design stream here every Tuesday, 4 p.m. PST. Hopefully we'll be able to do something next week when I'm in New York. We'll all post about that and let everyone know what the plan is. Um, yeah, if you like what you see here, you can follow the channel, you can subscribe, talk to me here or on Twitter about game design, and I'd love to hear what you're working on and help in any way that I can. <laughs> Senior Bob says, I just had mochi at work last week. Someone who is moving cleaned out her freezer. Okay, so I'm going to pop off in a second, but importantly, there's different types of mochi. mochi. I think most people who have had mochi have had mochi ice cream which is like your typical mochi rice flour pastry. It's frozen, has ice cream in the center, uh, which I think is good and tasty and gives you a good mochi experience. I usually prefer the mochi that's, that you get just in the, the grocery store with the rice flour with the red bean paste. Um, it's got that sweetness, it's got the chewiness to it, but it's not uh, it's not like an ice cream dessert thing. It's more like a warm room temperature dessert thing. I mean, I'll take mochi anyway it comes, but that is my preferred mochi distribution flavor consumption vehicle. <laughs> mochi distribution consumption vehicles. Cool. Well, that's it for today. Hopefully see you uh, on Friday, I will still be doing the Friday morning. I'm always on the Gen Con table takes if you like board game news. And then Friday evening, we do our casual weekly magic stream, although it might be Team Fight Tactics this week. As I mentioned, been having a lot of fun playing that. Uh, but otherwise, you can hit me up on Twitter anytime at Emma Larkins. And I will see you all again soon. Have a good rest of your week. Bye.